Yeah. Hi, baby. Hello. Good having you here. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. And uh, this may be new for some of you, but uh, in times past, in previous venues, we would do kind of these unplugged moments, little interviews and, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, just kind of family lounge chats. This is being a family service and everybody's here with us and we just felt we'd like to have that moment uh, with our family here. And, um, and people have questions, you know, that uh, they'd like to hear from us on. And, uh, and so that's what we're going to do. I've kinda wrote, I kind of wrote them in, in our words, but these are questions that you guys are asking. And of course, we don't have time for all of them. <laughs> We'd be here you know, for a long, long time, but just from our hearts, addressing some of the themes, some of the challenges, you know, things that are really pressing on our hearts and minds. And so we pulled some of them together, and we thought we'd just give it a shot. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. And so this is not in any specific order, you know, from importance to least importance, so just as they came... We just kind of, I wrote them down. So, so, babe, here's the first one. And if you want me to answer it first or you want to comment, it's however you want to do it, okay? So here it is. There are so many variables that are part of being good parents. Hello. <laughs> Lots. <laughs> there are many variables that are part of being good parents and providers for our kids. Um, what are your top three? What are the ones that are most significant for you? As parents, we, we are and were, you know, we raised four children. So what are the top three for you and why? Would you want me to go first? Go, want me to go first? Okay. Well, these, I mean, and number one, loving, knowing and loving Jesus. I, I, really, I, there's no better foundation. There's no better place to be grounded. Knowing and loving Jesus. And, and equally significant in tandem with that, there's no better way to show my love for my children than how I love my wife. You know, the first, really, that's, and, and, and those are in loving Jesus and loving my wife. Yeah. I mean, that is their first picture of what loving people looks like. You know, so, so the best way I can love my kids is to, yes, ma'am. Yes, honey. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. You got it. No, and really, I, I, I sincerely mean that. I mean, there, you, when you're dishonoring your spouses, you're sowing dishonor into your children. And they'll do the same thing, and then they'll carry that out of the home. So the way I love Connie, I mean, you know, Ephesians 5, you know, love your spouses, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Giving my life for my wife is, is, is foundational to giving my life for my children. And then the third thing is time spent, quality time. And whatever, and there's a lot of things that you put into that time, obviously. And, and I did, even though we were busy, I traveled a lot, but whenever I was home, I was there with them. I mean, I would go to my kids, you know, cricket practices. You know, I just showed up whenever I could. You know, the affirmation, um, affirming them and helping them discover who they are. You know, not imposing who I am. I'm contributing, creating an environment. But at the end of the day, I want them to discover who they are and how powerful they are, you know, and, um, and responsibility and those things. But the bottom line is you've got to make time. It does not happen unless you're there. So those three things, Jesus, knowing him, loving him, submitting to you, <laughs> know, knowing and honoring this great woman of God, their mother, and, uh, and then spending quality time with them. So did you want to contribute to that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to um, just add a few things. And it's very hard because there's so many qualities in parenthood that are important. So we, you know, I like to think in bullet lists, but I, I can't speak to you in bullet lists today. <laughs> uh, stability, creating a very, very stable home is important. And structure is important. So all the kids in the back, when your parents say, here's dinner time, here's bedtime, here's homework time, here's play time, that structure is so important because it teaches you how to control yourself, 
manage your time. It's a learning curve from up. And so you, you think these are little things, but they're not really little things. They're giving stability. They're giving security to your children. Right. They know what to expect from the day. And especially when they're young, right. they really need that stability. Yeah. Another thing is communication. We can pass through so much time without really communicating. We're there, but we're not communicating. And communication takes work. It takes, sometimes you have to pull a child aside, spend extra time with them, a lot of time, so they can open up their heart. Many children go through rough seasons, really tough times, and they don't tell their parents what's going on. But they're not finding the right time. And always try and create space yeah, right. for your children yeah. to share with you. That's really good. And asking questions. Often we're so busy giving answers that really they're not asking for. And so, and I think back, I wish I would have asked my, because some of your children are very verbal, you know, and they will just volunteer, but others aren't, you know. I mean, we had a son that wasn't like that at all, and, and I wish I would have asked more questions and discovered things that were going on so I could have been there for him better. So asking questions is a big deal. Honey, can we just slide over? I realize we're just off center a bit. Is that okay? There we go. Okay. okay. Is this good? Are you guys digging this or something? Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's not brand new, but, you know, uh -huh. it's all right. It's okay, good, so good. I want to say one more thing. Oh, go ahead, babe. I could say two more things, but I'm going to touch on one. Um, joy in family. Having a family that's full of joy. We can be serious. We can come home and have so much stress or pressure, cooking, doing this, and we're operating under pressure. The, there's families that I've watched, and the families that laugh together can play pranks on each other, um, can tease one another, not in a mean way, not in a, um, you know, where you're poking and in wounding, in but in fun ways, you know, just having fun things that you do. Being able to really laugh, enjoy laughter. Those children are so healthy in life. That's right. They have learned how to laugh. They carry laughter and joy. They could be going through a hard moment and they get home, but there's joy yeah. coming from their parents. Right. Um, I, so I'm good. sure you've seen this. We have a few people in this church and they say something and then they laugh. Hmm. And I started learning from them because I wasn't a big laughter person. I'm more, you know, serious, <laughs> thinking, melancholy, I can be in my brain a lot. But watching those people, and they always are bringing joy. So learning things that you just say, I want to release joy. I want to release joy. It's really joy. good, baby. And, uh, yeah. and here's the cool thing. It's not, people often think, well, that's just a personality issue. No, it's a, it's, it's a Jesus issue. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, paint, joy. It's the fruit of the Spirit. You know, and you can tap into that. And, and it, it is so important. Fun. Fun should be one of your core values. You know, God's a fun God. And he's also pretty funny, you know. I mean, he made, you know. He, why, the reason why we can laugh is because God laughs. He created us with, for laughter. It's healthy, you know. A, a joyful heart is good medicine. And, and it's not about the conditions around you. It's about the one within you, you know, and when you can laugh in those tough conditions, wow, heaven's right there. And so if, if you need to help to kind of get started, just come over here. Come our way. We'll get you started, you know. But yes, it is so important. Can I go on to the second question? Okay, gosh, that was just one question. Um, and here is the second one. All right, a little bit, a little bit more serious, Okay. Since we know that damage can happen from broken marriages and dysfunctional families, how can those of us who come from them, okay, or are still navigating them not stay damaged by them? Uh, because there's, there's, I don't know if there's, quite frankly, I don't think there's anything more damaging than a dysfunctional family and broken families. You know, the, the doors that open up um, and the, the, you know, just the challenges we uh, that that next generation faces, and and as someone that survived a very damaging childhood and family life, and then built, I would say, a healthy, successful marriage. I mean, 42 years, amen. Yeah, too bad. And I mean, I come when I say broken. I mean, my dad was married four times, my mom three. Just to give you an idea. 
and I, I could say more horrible things about what happened, but, but, how, but so if anybody's qualified to, to address that, you know, when you, and, be, and it's not just something that just goes away overnight. I mean, it was very, very real, and it wasn't magical. And so it's, it's important that we know um, when we're, we're, some of us that are still feeling the, the weight of that, the effects of that, the trauma of that, that's very, very real. And, um, and, I, and I, I don't want to oversimplify this because I know it's a process. Healing's not an event, it's a process. I get that. And then there are tools that God gives to us, pastoring and sozos and deliverance and trauma, I, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it, it's all rooted in this. If, if Jesus came to set us free from sin and death, if he can set us free from the power of sin and death, nothing worse than that, and certainly he can restore us and heal us from rejection, abuse, abandonment, it, really bad ignorance, deficits that come out of just poor families or the lack thereof, right? We know that's true. Of course, that's true. And um, I mean, I, the, what I love about the Bible, I love how God uses example, extreme examples um, in representing how powerful his truth is. It's like when you watch those commercials and they want to show you how powerful that vacuum cleaner is, you know, or that cleanser is, and they make the nastiest, worst mess on the carpet, right? I mean, they make it so bad you think there's no way that's coming off, and then they put in the, you know, the vacuum cleaner or the carpet cleaner, and woo, it's brand new. God does the same thing. Josiah, Josiah. Read about Josiah. His grandfather was Manasseh. His dad was Ammon. They were the most demonized, evil kings in the history of Israel. They sacrificed their own children, made them pass through the fire, worshiping Moloch. They were like nasty on steroids. They really were. And Josiah, it says that he, in, 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 in 2 Chronicles, if you look in the Chronicles version of it, it says that he sought the God of his father, David. You know, because he certainly couldn't seek because the God of his father, you know, his biological fathers were demons. You know, that's who they served. They served demons. But he sought the God of his father, David, and he was changed and he brought tremendous revival. And so just remembering that, number one, and this is the two things I think of. Number one is that Jesus, this is what Jesus paid for. This is what he went to the cross for. He didn't go to the cross so that I could just suffer and just slide into heaven as a dysfunctional wreck of a human being, no matter what I went through. So I'm here to say, guess what? You can be healed. You can be free. You don't have to reproduce the, the previous generation's rejections and pains and hurt. He has healing, and then he gives us the relationships and the tools uh, in order for us to enjoy that. you want to respond to that? You sure? Okay, all right. Thank you, Jesus. Here's the third one, all right? And, um, and this is in my language, even though this, was, this is the essence of what people were saying. If the Father loves me, and Jesus saved me, and the Holy Spirit fills me, then why do I battle so much junk? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, well, you know. Isn't that true? It's like, way, well, way, well, you know, I got saved. I thought it was all going to be wonderful. And it is. You're saved. <laughs> you know, you've got a new nature. You have a new identity. But it doesn't change the enemy. We live, you know what I'm saying? I mean, first of all, we live in a fallen world. We go through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, Jesus came down perfect and he was tempted in all things. In temptation, he felt the pressure. It's not a temptation unless you feel like you can do it. Wow, Jesus felt like doing all those bad things that you did. <laughs> you know? And also, we have an enemy that hates the fact that the Father loves us, Jesus saved us, and the Holy Spirit filled us. And then number three, we are imperfect people being perfected. Yeah. You know, I remember when I first got born, it was radical. I, I mean, it was day and night. When I got born again, I was changed in a moment in the sense of new spirit. I was like, wow. 
wow, you know, this life, even my countenance changed. But then after, you know, and there's that honeymoon phase. It's just like everything is wonderful. And then I don't know what it was, maybe two months, three months later, I can't remember. All of a sudden, man, it's like battles. You know, the enemy comes knocking. No, you're not really a child of God. You're still full of lust. You're still full of anger. You know, I'm thinking, what's going on here? Well, there's the thing called renewing going on. My spirit's saved. My, body, my soul is, is, is being renewed day by day. And here's what I realize is that, you know, I just, God wants me to be a part of the process. It's not just doing things to me. It's doing things with me. It, and it's wonderful. That's how we grow. Like, and you know, as a child, you know, it's not just what's done for you. It's done with you that allows you to develop character and learn skills and develop strength, right? If everything's done for you, then you're, 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 you're an invalid. You're incapable of anything. God wants to do things with us. That's why he didn't just wave the magic wand and, whoo, it's all gone. No more pressure. You don't feel anything. See, that's heaven. One day in heaven, it's, but on this side, we get to participate. We get to grow. We get to experience what it's like to apply faith in his direction and overcome. And so, yeah, anyway, now you want to add to that? I, no? You said it so well. <laughs> I, oh, come on. Don't think I would add I mean, Jesus much. said in John 16, 33, in the world you have what? That's right, but be of good courage. I've overcome it. So in the world, you have tribulation. You have battles, but I have overcoming. And, and overcoming is not just an event. It really is a process, and we do need to remember that. And also remember this. Just because you feel bad doesn't mean you're not winning. <laughs> Pop psychology is elevated feelings to, to some irresistible force. You know, that's ridiculous. You're not defined by a feeling. Feelings are indicators of reality, but not tellers of truth. Remember that. Just because you feel something doesn't mean you are something. Ah, hello? <laughs> you got to remember the, the tempter. That's his nature, not yours. Remember your nature. You're getting hit with anger. That's not your nature. Now, you can give in to it like a dummy, but that's not who you are. You've got to remember that. When you live from your identity, you fight not with another behavior. You fight from, oh, this is what he made me to be. This is who he says I am. Amen. Come on. Okay. All right. All right. You sure? You got so much stuff. To... I know. I know. I really am. I know. Um, I mean, I'm, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm ready to go. But, uh. I think they want to hear from you more than me. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, think, think, about, like, think about it like this. I, I, I kind of wrote this down as a thought. Can moments of good behaviors make you a Christian? No. All right. Then how can a moment of a bad behavior make you not one? You, you got to remember that. And see, you got to know that because the enemy just beats you up when you have those bad moments, but it doesn't change who you are and how he is towards you. You live from identity, not the behaviors. That's right. Remember That's that. Right. It's the only way you win. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I got to make, I got to get to one you're going to step in, in on. Um, maybe I shouldn't even give any answers. Um, okay. Here's another one. What do you believe is our greatest enemy and battle today? And it's, it's, for me, it's pretty simple. It's pride and, and pride and fear. That's it. I mean, there's a lot of things that the enemy uses in the context of pride and fear, but it's pride and fear. There's a lot of other battles we have, but it's pride and fear and the lies that accompany the pride and the fear that is the biggest adversary. It's absolutely, I believe that. And, and, and the solution is simple, but it's not easy. It really is so simple. It's called humility. That's it. I mean, I mean, I love James 4, 6 and 7. It says, God's opposed to the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble. And then it says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But see, a lot of people resist the devil before they've submitted to God. You can't win by resisting the devil. You win by humbling yourself, submitting to his truth. And that sometimes is submitting to another person, listening to them, humbling yourself, repenting. 
You know, it's, it, that's it. Those two things, pride and then fear. And you hide, you know, because of fear of rejection, you know, fear of judgment, you know, all those fears. And so it's just humility. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. I mean, 1 Peter 5.5 5 says the same thing. He's opposed to the proud. He resists. Pride is resisted, but he gives grace. Man, amazing grace. Um, so anyway, okay, you're going to respond to that? I'm just going to add, um, there's the inward battles that you feel, and then there's the outward battles. And then there's the world, the environment that we live in, those battles. So you do have battles on different levels. There's what you can really manage with God when he's dealing with the internal, which would be pride and fear. Then you, you step away and you say, what are the battles I'm facing maybe with my family or in work or business? What are those battles? Because those are your real battles. Mm. And then outside there's things, yeah, you're going to face them. You know, in the world you have tribulation. But don't take on battles that God has not given you. Don't pick up a sword for something that God didn't say, fight this battle. Just really pay attention to what God is speaking to you, what God is doing, and that's where you take your shield and your sword. So don't jump beyond God's coverage for you. And really the good. better you do, the better you do dealing with the inside, working from the inside, getting healthy from the inside, then the easier all these other um, spiritual confrontations will be. That's right. That's what I'll yeah. add to there. Yeah. And I got to tell you, there's few things that helps us stay close to what's real humility. I don't mean false humility. Humility really is uh, keep agreeing with what God says about you. You know what I'm saying? And, but, but there's few places for that to happen better than in relationships. I mean, there's really, there's a place in humility. It, you know, it's not, you know, being humble before God is just, that's already a done deal. And what no one's saying, what I mean by that is like, it's just, you know, you know, we, we in, in, in the spirit realm, whether you are humble before him, not you are. You know what I'm saying? It's like that is just a, but it's, it's the horizontal. It's these relationships that really makes it real for us, yeah. makes it practical and applies it. So that's why you need to have, be in the body and have important relationships. Um, this one right here, how do you handle regret? Any, 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 no, nobody in here. You know, you guys have, you guys have done everything perfectly, you know. Um, how do you handle regret? It is a big one because we all wish we could have done that over. You know, I mean, I've been, we've been married a long time. We've been in ministry a long time. We've done a little, I'm going, you know, I would have gone, I would have done that one different. You know, I wish I could have done that different. But, but let me just say this. There's a difference between I wish I could have done that differently and living in regret. Regret is a terrible place to be. It really is. It's a sorrow. And, and, and the enemy uses that to create a prison in the of the past, you know what I'm saying? You, it's, it's, there is a grieving, I, there's a grieving process, but there's a difference between a grieving process where, um, you know, we know um, it's, you know, first it starts, you know, denial and then anger and then bargaining, then depression, then acceptance. And I, there is, you know, and, 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 and the, uh, Paul told the Thessalonians, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. So there is a grieving, but regret is different. You know, regret is like I said, you just, you're just, your soul is camped out in, in what didn't happen. And you're seeing the now only through that lens. And so the only, from my perspective, the best way to deal with regret is with another re-word. <laughs> A lot of re-words. And the best one I like is redeem. Redeem. And, and my favorite character is Job. Remember, remember God uses the extreme because none of us have it as bad as Job. You may feel like it, but trust me, not close. You know, I mean, really, it's like we may have a, a piece of the hole that he had. And, and I mean, he just, I mean, he lost everything. And his body is just beaten bloody with boils and just everything is bad. His buddies are beating up on him. And, and right in the middle of that, right in the middle of it, this wasn't at the end of it when he got, you know, the breakthrough. It was in the middle of it. It was in Job 1925. 1925. He's still in the middle of it. He's still being pounded by his buddies, you know. And he says, this I know. <laughs> My Redeemer lives. 
Man, as bad as it feels, as bad as it looks, my Redeemer lives. And guess what? When he came out of the other side, he knew God more. First of all, he was changed. He was free from the fear because what he feared came upon him. He was in bondage to religious fear. Religion makes you fearful. Oh, no, I might have not done it perfectly. You know, it's, it's about performance rather than being, you know, about who you are. And so he was bound up by fear. That's what opened up the door for the enemy to come do that to him. So he was free from fear. He knew God better than ever. It says now he's got, he's got seven sons. He's got three daughters that no gals in the entire region can compare with. And he's got double the blessing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like the, the redemption. Knowing that, you know, he brings us out of it. Uh, understanding that he causes all things to work together for good. He doesn't cause all things, but he causes them to work together. And how many of us have those testimonies? A Christian testimony is not, you know, there's no giants, there's no fiery furnaces, you know, there's, uh, you know what I'm saying, there's no lion's dens. It's the fact that you're in the fiery furnace, but you're not smelling of smoke. You know, you're not consumed. You're in a lion's den, but you're sleeping. You know, uh, you're facing giants and you're taking off heads. You know, kind of thing. So, though the point is, is that it's it's the redemption. It's knowing that boy, he's bigger than that moment. That's how I've dealt with yeah, regret. Yeah. And you're <laughs> I'm turn. interrupting. Yeah, go go for it. Go for it. Um, I just want to give you the practical part because uh, regret can stay with us longer when we're bearing the consequences, <laughs> and or when you when you see some a decision you made or something you did and someone else is bearing your consequences and it's painful to watch it's painful to experience so you have to be able to let go of that and there's a process of getting through regret like bill says you don't want to camp out in it you don't want to make a little oasis around your regret mm -hmm. and then you're stuck and you go into a terrible depression and hopelessness um, people do handle regret differently it's true some people grieve through it. That may take them a little time, but you're always bringing God into that equation. Sometimes you get so fearful because the mistake you made, and fear paralyzes people. That's one of the big things the enemy does through fear is he paralyzes you so you don't move forward, so you don't take action. And whenever you're dealing with grit, you have to look at what, what actions can I take to shift this? Because you get out of regret when you have hope, Right. And you see that you could redeem that mistake really or good. that situation can be redeemed, whether it's with a child, a friend, financially, mm -hmm. or in a marriage. That's, so good. That's good. So some of that process I'm just going to give you, which is uh, really quick, is uh, repent. <laughs> Sometimes God wants you to recognize <laughs> the mistake because, you know, he, he's the great teacher and he loves uh, walking through life with you and teaching you how to live life better. So uh, repent. Mm. Catch what you've done wrong and acknowledge that before God. If you need to acknowledge it with people, with children, with friends, say, hey, look, I, I really blew it there. I missed it. I made a bad decision. I made a bad decision at work. We all have a little bit of the consequence. I don't want to carry the grit. So you, you go back and you deal with it. Uh, another thing you do is you forgive. You, mm. have to for, you have to forgive yourself. Most of the time people struggle because they feel that's big or you have to forgive the person that maybe made the decision that affected you so badly and then you, you're like, oh, I regret going into business with them. I regret knowing them. I regret trusting them. You, know, you, have, to, you have to work through that. So you have it's to really forgive good, them. Right? It's really good. And then... Um, you, uh, another thing is, you, you're going to pray and you're going to say, how can I rectify it? Like, how can this be redeemed? Because sometimes you can just say, in my mind, in a fantasy world, God can redeem this. But sometimes you can very practically redeem some of those things. And the effort goes into, I've got to pray through it. I hear God. I cry out for his wisdom. And I look for a way mm. to to see this redeemed. Really and so that's where you partner with God. And the last thing, and this is what I think God really wants you to learn from, is really learn from your mistakes. And sometimes write a little journal entry, take some notes. What did I learn from this? Because God will use that wisdom for you to give to someone that's else really or to your children 
or to a marriage or to someone in business. So capture that because sometimes we go through life and we just speed through. It's good. Yeah. And you don't learn what God wants you to learn and you don't become the teacher that God wants you to be That's for other really people. Good. Wow. So, that was yeah. good. Now, I'm going to ask a question. There's a question, but you're going to answer it, okay? Is that okay? All right. Uh, you're, you're on a flow. You're on a roll here. Um, under, I, I don't know if you answered this. I think we touched on it just a little bit, but under stress and pressure, how do I keep joy and love flowing in my life and family? Um, under pressure. <laughs> okay. Here's the things you have to do. We, we went through a horrible time one time. It was like, you know, living in hell. Who Just, did? We did. Oh, we did. <laughs> and, and I, like, how am I going to have joy in here? How am I going to have peace in here? It just looks like the rug got pulled out from under me, and I don't even know which way is up. Like, I'm in the forest, and I can't see the wood for the trees. And so I did things to make me laugh and to have joy and to take my mind off of it. And back in the day, it was America's Funniest Home Videos. True. Whatever I could true. do to laugh. Whatever I could do to laugh. I had to have joy. I had to have something. I, I'm, I'm the melancholy, so if you know the melancholy temperament, the brain starts going, like, and it starts revolving. And, and then all of a sudden, one bad thought takes you to another one, takes you to another one, takes you to another Before you know it, you've dug a pit with your brain. So you, you can't let your brain go. You have to stop thoughts and say, nope, what's God saying? How do I distract it? How do I, it's kind of like, how do I reprogram this? How do I press reset? So that my brain and my thoughts can take me up towards God. And, That's and good. so I would, I would also have to do that. That's really and, good. Um, and then learn to laugh with your partner. Like I said, that laughing game. Um, I didn't even understand how this works, and I didn't have very many spiritual encounters with it, but I heard that God did this. So one time we were driving the car, and we were both so depressed. And I said, well, I'm going to throw a fireball at you. So here's a fireball. Here's something from heaven. Here's a heavenly bomb. And, you know, we we're like, he's looking at me trying to drive. Like, this is just <laughs> so weird. <laughs> But you know what? You have to distract you start yourself laughing. from the trauma and the pain because the enemy wants to take you and just suck you into a, a zone of depression, and then you pull everyone into that negative atmosphere. Can, can I give them one that seems, I know this sounds really odd, but I promise you it works. Start speaking in tongues to each other. Yes, yes, uh -huh. yes. Yes. You really then start laughing. Yes. Whatever it takes to, you are laugh, laughter and joy is a spiritual force, but sometimes you have to do things to help catalyze it. It's just faith. You're exercising your faith is what you're doing. You know, I mean, it's not pretend, you're not pretending, but you're activating it. So those things really do work. Yeah. Fireball, fireball, take one. Fireball. And pretty soon you start feeling them and you do scream when they hit you. <laughs> See, it I'm works. Sure you've Fireball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I just, okay, I, I just won. I, I, My last one? Yeah, this is the last one, but it's, it's not on your sheet, I don't think. Oh, that one's mine. Oh, do you want me to do that I, one? I, I want to do that one. Oh, wait. Oh, I don't have this one. I don't have this one. Okay. This, well, can I read it? Yeah. I'll read it. Why is it important to learn to obey? Wives? No, I'm kidding. No, no. no. <laughs> for kids. This is, for this children. Is for Why is it important for, to learn to here. obey? This is for the kids. Yeah. And the big kids. It's not always comfortable to obey, is it? Like, we're, we're, our parents tell us to do something, and you're like, why, no. Maybe. Procrastinate, drag their feet. Yes, yes. And there's a lot of reasons. Your parents love you so much. Most of the time when they tell you to do things, they're trying to protect you or they're trying to teach you how life works. They're trying to put you in stability and healthy structure. You know, the strong-willed child is easier to disobey. It feels like rebellion, but, you know, maybe you're not rebellion. It's just, I just don't want to do that right now. I just don't know why I should make my bed every day. I don't know why I shouldn't ride my bike in the street like that and do that. But, you know, God gives us boundary lines, 
And he tells us to obey the scripture. He tells us to obey the Ten Commandments. He gives us precepts to follow. And they're safety lines. They're, they're lines. They're a place that keep you protected in life. So I'm going to give you a story from my childhood. And it was one of my biggest lessons in learn to obey and obey quickly. I did have a very strong father, and he was a wonderful, wonderful father. He just worked so hard, and he wanted us to have this great quality of life. And he had horses for all of us when I was young. I was about seven or eight, and I had this um, old little pony horse that was very slow. <laughs> but um, in, the, in the winter, we, I lived up, we lived very high, it's called high desert, but we'd have a lot of snow, and you couldn't get out to your horses mostly in the winter because the, the snow or the ground was frozen. But my dad, good guy, he'd go out and feed in very cold weather every morning. But when spring came, I would be so excited because I would get to go, and that would be my first time, so I'd get to start riding again. And one day, um, he got me up real early, and we headed out to the horses, and I was, like I said, I was pretty small. And um, I was so excited. The minute we got there, I jumped out of the truck and I started running towards the corral and then there was a barn. And I climbed up the wood fence, got to the top, and my dad yelled, stop. He just yelled, stop. And, you know, I, my mind could say, oh, just jump. You know, just jump in, get the hay, start doing your thing, what you love. And I, but I stopped. And I was so thankful I stopped and he said, wait for me. I didn't know why he was telling me to wait for me. He couldn't explain it. But what happened is in springtime, the rattlesnakes have their babies. They lay their eggs and they have their babies and they like to nest in the hay. And if I hadn't stopped at his stop, I would have jumped into a nest of baby rattlers. And that was deadly. So, you know, kids, what I want to say to you, your parents don't tell you things just to tell you because it makes them feel good. <laughs> they are really trying to teach you the concept of listen and obey, listen and obey. And obeying the Lord, being able to respond to the Lord in obedience is so important. Dion's testimony, he was responding to obedience to the Lord. You know, he was following the Lord, praying in tongues, what do I do? He was listening to the Lord that whole time. And God wants to ask us to do bold things, sometimes dangerous things, but you have to listen to the Lord. You listen and obey, and I know I say that a lot, but I think, you know, kids, life is full of God asking you to do uncomfortable things or hard things or challenging things. So I want to encourage you to learn to listen to obeying your parents. <laughs> it's the training ground. And then listen and obey the Lord. Yeah, That's, that's really good. And <laughs> as we close this, there are first base of covenant is love. That's first base. That's the most fundamental, lowest level of covenant. The next level is trust. And then, ple and then pleasing. See, you can, God loves you because of who he is. But then he trusts you and he's pleased with you because of the way you live. There's a difference. I don't just want my wife's love. I got that because I married her. I want her trust. And I want even more than that. I want her pleased. I want to be the source of her pleasure. So, you know, you can love someone and not trust them. And that's really what happens. That's what obedience does. A character is like, wow, I can count on you. I can trust you. I, we want God to trust. He loves us. And like, wow, that's the grounding for everything but to trust us with his glory, to trust us with his gifts and graces, and then beyond that, to be his pleasure. Oh, <laughs> to be his pleasure. Father, we thank you so much for just who we are, who you are and who we are. We are your family, your sons and daughters. You went and paid that price to purchase us back, not just for a new set of behaviors, but a whole brand new life of knowing you, loving you, walking with you, revealing you. You know, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus like this, you've been around religion, you've been around church, if you live in South Africa, it's everywhere. You really don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If 
for whatever reason, it doesn't matter what the reason is, you do not know Jesus like this. You do not have this kind of relationship. He loves you. He died for you. He's got his blood ready to apply to your life, every area of it, to save you, deliver you, and heal you. So with every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment, if you're here and you want to give your heart fully and completely to Jesus, would you raise your hand? If you need to do that, just raise your hand if anybody in here needs to do that, okay? Right there, darling, okay. Anybody else? Raise it up where I can see it. I won't see it. Anybody else? Okay, right there. God bless you over there. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Can we stand to our feet? Let's just stand to our feet for just a minute, okay? Just stand to our feet. Listen, I know this is this this could be difficult for you. I get it, but you know it's 